Hello. <laughs> it's us again. Um, we're here to um, do our presentation for you. Hope you enjoyed your vacation. Here's Erica, Gloria, Felicia's here, Heather. and Heather in the background. Okay. <laughs> so let's get started. For many kids, starting school is a rite of passage. This important life event will be remembered by the plethora of photos their parents took or drawings from their first day of class. How does family, culture, and community impact children entering school for the first time? Family interactions at home is the first place where a child will have mental stimulation. The family's dynamic affects how they interact with other people, how they learn, and their previous knowledge is what they can bring to the classroom. When teaching preschool age children, you need to focus on learning through play and exploration. Children who learn through hands-on activities receive an exciting, meaningful educational experience. Children at this age also learn best when interacting one-on-one -on -one with their peers. These two reasons are why most preschool classes do a lot of learning through center-based activities. These centers usually consist of math, literacy, science, art, and dramatic play. And as you see in our pictures, We've got some pictures of different children at different centers, and usually how these work is they'll be at one center for a few minutes, and then timer will go off, okay, rotate, and then you rotate to your next center. That way, everybody gets to touch the center, or sometimes it's just, you know, the kids pick what center they want to go to, and then when it's time to rotate, then they pick the next one. Sometimes the teacher assigns it, and then sometimes the children get to choose. The lesson that I picked was for a math center and it was exploring with magnets. Um, the life of a preschool student is filled with science. <coughs> They're constantly exploring and unknowingly being little science ev scientists every day. Children at that age are constantly asking questions, exploring, picking up rocks, doing all kinds of things that really is science-based and they just don't know it. With any subject, to have a successful center, you have to do a mini lesson. This will let students know what to do with the items and get them excited about exploring. During this lesson, it is important to ask questions and allow them to ask questions too. By doing this, you gain interest and awaken their inner scientist. So with that, the first thing that I will do in my lesson is I will actually um, do a mini lesson. And starting a mini lesson, I really like to read books because I think kids love books. And this book is really cool. It's Magnetic Max. <clears throat> and Max is this cool kid that knows all about magnets. Um, to introduce the magnet lesson to the students, I will read Magnetic Max. Max loves exper experimenting with magnets. He really knows how they, how they work and loves using them to attract all kinds of objects. He decides to show him to his friend Nick, and Nick is mystified. He wants to know more. Will magnets stick to a refrigerator, a screw, an animal? How do they work? Maybe it's magic. So that's why I picked this book, because it's really kind of cool, and it's got a little kid in it that's really excited about magnets. After reading the book, I will then introduce the children, or the students, um, to the magnet sorting box, which is this box right here, and the magnet, or magnetic treasure bottle, this bottle right here. The treasure box, or I'm sorry, the magnetic sorting box has items in it that are plastic and are metal and are wood. And basically what they do is they will use little magnets and they will grab little items. And obviously if it sticks, then they put it in the magnetic. If it doesn't stick, then they put it in the non-magnetic. This also is a good way to... Um, 
build their fine motor, kind of uh, give them a sorting option because you know it's really easy um, way to, to get some sorting in and at that age um, sorting objects and sorting out things is, is a really good thing. Um, this bottle right here is actually also filled with stuff that's magnetic and not and they use the little um, magnet to bring everything to the top of the rice so it's kind of fun and they can do it together um, and they get to search for buried treasure. Um, I will let them know that these items will be at the Science Center for them to explore with their friends and then I will also put the book over there and while they're in the Science Center I will go over and kind of talk to them, see what their thoughts are, see um, kind of experiment, do you think this is going to be magnetic, do you not think this is going to be magnetic, and really just kind of um, try to get them even more involved and more, um, more excited about it. So there you go. All right, so here's mine. I chose, uh, well, I have English language arts, so I chose to do poetry. In my lesson, what we would do first is make sure the students know what these shapes are. If we're um, with pre-K kids, some kids may actually not be familiar with simple shapes like triangle, circle, and square, which is what the poem is about. Um, first, we would review the shapes like I said in the poem before we read, and then we would read the poem shapes to the students. And as you read, you would want to direct the students to pay attention to the shapes mentioned, you know, as we spoke about the shapes before um, in the poem, and then discuss the shapes as you reread the poem and, um, you know, point out this is the circle, this is the square, this is the triangle, and just keep pointing it out so kids know that these are the main characters in the poem. Um, and after that, you're going to ask students to imagine what the scene looked like and illustrate it. Now, what I did, because I noticed that the, the, the kids I was, you know, trying to experiment on could not um, draw and listen at the same time. It was kind of hard for them. And so I had them close their eyes and imagine what I was reading before I actually had them sit down and draw. And then as they were drawing, I would you know, kind of like read the poem, but in a lower voice. So it was just kind of in the background and if they needed a piece of information, they could be like, oh yeah, the other shape is a square. So, so the poem I chose was, it's called Shapes by Shel Silverstein. Um, this is some, the artwork from the book. I just made it when it was tumbling down something because I thought that would be a clutter. So the poem goes, a square was sitting quietly outside his rectangular shack. When a triangle came down, plunk, and struck him in his back. I must go to the hospital, cried the wounded square. So the passing rolling circle picked him up and took him there. So I reread that several times and, um, and let the kids kind of imagine what was going on. And in the next slide, I have some examples, or this is what I just explained to you. <laughs> um, but in the examples, it was pretty interesting because all the kids had different interpretations of this very short poem. Um, and so here's the actual kids. I have kids in my child care program um, come one by one to let me do this lesson because I was genuinely interested in what they would come up with. Um, and so in the first one uh, was made by this student named Griffin. He's a boy. Um, he, when I read the story to him, I had him draw it out, I asked him, explain what your illustration um, means. And he said, the triangle said for Blanc and hit him. And that was his whole explanation of his, of the poem that I just read. I thought it was funny because they're all separated. They show the shapes clearly, but it did not illustrate what happened in the poem. So I thought that was kind of funny. Um, and the next one, his name is Bentley. So this specific student um, I chose because he has attention problems. Um, and uh, he can never sit still. We always have to redirect him. And so I thought it would be interesting to see his interpretation. Um, and the color he chose was also really interesting because he chose brown. Like he really didn't think about it. He didn't care as the other kids did. You know, I want red, I want blue, I want orange. You know, they really cared about what colors we use. And this specific student was like, yeah, I'll just take the brown, I don't care. 
um, had nothing to do with the poem I read, even though I read it six different times to him. Um, this is someone, that's what he told me he was, and this is the doctor's house, um, and this is the tree in the grass, and that's how he explained it to me, and I say, explain your illustration to me, and that was his explanation. <laughs> um, the next kid, uh, her name is Yeva, um, she was sick in the office today, so I just tried this out on her, so she actually did a little bit more, and I thought that was pretty cool. But um, her interpretation was the triangle was coming down some stairs. There was no stairs mentioned in this poem, but I thought she it was funny. She imagined there were stairs. And she, he fell down the stairs and hit the square in the back. Um, and so, I don't know, this is the circle who had to carry them, and he's pretty unhappy. Um, and here's two rectangles. I don't know why there's two, but one's happy, one's sad, and here's a triangle coming down the stairs. Um, I guess maybe it's a before and after. I don't know because there's another one like I think she was writing literally the entire storyline I think in her head she was doing the whole storyline like everything it was saying she was um, Interpreting it so I thought that was pretty cool and It tells me about that student that she is really listening and she's interpreting this in her own way So that was pretty cool um, and this little girl though she didn't put much RJ really thought about it and she came up with the whole storyline. Her explanation was quite more like I kind of jotted down what she said. She said, the square is on a couch, and then the triangle was crawling in the house, and it accidentally poked the square in the back, and the square went to the hospital um, with the triangle because he hit him in the back. And she didn't really mention the circle, but she did say, here's the triangle and the circle, you know he was taking the square to the hospital because he's the one who got hit in the back. So I found that very interesting um, that how these kids interpreted that poem. Um, let's see. So after I admit that I showed him this video, I don't know if this video is or it's playing, but it's playing very, I guess the sound's not on. But there's, he's just reading this poem and it's physically showing what happened to the, the uh, rectangle when this triangle hit him in the back. And it showed this, so this is his actual illustration, Shel Silverstein's illustration, and I'm gonna come and bring it to the camera. So after I, you know, read the poem <coughs> to the kids, I did ask him, you know, what was different between his illustration for the poem and yours? And we, you know, we talked about it and that's how I got all those little explanations from those kids. And um, when I showed them this uh, specific, you know, illustration from the book, they were blown away that that's his illustration. They thought it would be so much more intricate than it actually was. And I, I thought that was funny. Um, and, you know, I just asked what's missing from this. And they're like the house, you know, the background, the, you know, they were just, coming up all sorts of stuff, so I thought that was pretty cool, and I just kept asking questions to see where it could lead, and um, it, was it was pretty cool. It was interesting. math activity, organizing numbers, grouping, and counting. Uh, this is a very simple activity, but I start with the beginnings to the kids to uh, start recognizing numbers. In the beginning, I do one through three, and then I go forward, and five, and until 20. Um, basically, the other slide, Basically, the activity consists in Read the book, find your pumpkins, and then show numbers, cards, and this moment I am 1 to 12, show the numbers, and count them 1 to 20. And, and then I show these two trays with numbers on it, and little objects to put in there. While I was counting one, we put one object and two, two objects. And also I use this little number line because some of the kids cannot recognize the numbers so they just, uh, what is the number four? And they just go one, two, three, four. Oh, this is four. What is the number four? He has the number four. How many can I put there? Four. And also I had this little 
pumpkins. And they stick with the uh, numbers of the pumpkins that I have in each one. And basically it's the same and the activity is repeated. And um, this can be flexible because some can just know one number, two numbers. And also I used to clap hands when we are counting or dance with the same activities. And I love this activity because it shows them how to group in at the same time they recognize number and then I count. That's the activity. <laughs> Okay, um, so I was talking about um, celebrations, um, family and culture, and the activity with the students would be, first of all, we would read a book, Celebrations, and then, you know, we, we would learn about family celebrations, and we would talk about different celebrations that each children, each child, sorry, um, what they celebrate with their families and how they celebrate. And then um, I would tell the children that some people dance in celebrations. And we would, um, family and culture, uh, community, they provide kind of like the foundation for child development. And so these three things also teach children, you know, how to interact socially. And so I felt that dance would be a good way to teach family and culture because everybody likes to dance. And dance is a way to kind of, sort of to say, break the ice, make everybody comfortable. And, and when the students see the teachers interacting and enjoying the activity, then that makes them enjoy it more and want to do it more. And so we would do the cha-cha slide, and which I'm sure you're familiar with or you've heard. And it's actually, you know, really a lot of body movement, and we would actually, you know, kind of go into the, the, the movements of the left, and then they go to the right, and then they're stomping one time, or stomping two times, or jumping, or moving to the back, right and left. And so I think this, um, <laughs> kind of always that commercial. But I feel that dance, like once again, is, you know, a universal way to get children comfortable into wanting to learn and enjoying learning. And once again, it's fun. Music is, is, a, is a form, a way that um, education is going into to teach children. And once again, you know, I think this would be a great activity um, to teach family culture. So would she have sound when she sees it? Or? No. No sound. Okay, but once again, I'm sure you know about the cha-cha slide and you've heard it. And like I say, you know, it's teaching them direction, teaching them numbers, teaching them position, working with the gross motor, and learning new vocabulary, as well as having fun. So I can help a little. Okay. Um, so I You can open that. Oh, it's just. Okay. So I picked my lesson um, of a science center with using magnets um, because, one, after watching the videos and kind of reading in the book, um, children at that age they learn through each other and they learn through play. So that's why most preschools have like a center activity um, so that the kids can interact with each other and, and explore. And it's something that kind of turns their mind into another place. Um, so that's why I picked my map, or I'm sorry, my science magnets. I picked my lesson um, because I believed it was age appropriate for pre-K and after watching the videos um, I like the way they explain how kids learn you know how they get from point A to point B to point C to the answer um, and how to really critically think instead of you know, you know kids memorizing things which I feel like it's um, a huge problem today is, you know kids are memorizing material 
and not actually learning how they got that answer. And so in my lesson, I chose um, poetry because it's short and then had a lot of imagination to it, which is why I chose Shel Silverstein because, you know, he's known for just having wonky poems and just like, and so I chose mine because I felt that my questions, you know, after reading the poem to them would make them think critically about, you know, um, the poem that I was reading and it would have, and have them think about it in their heads, like imagine what I'm reading to them and it allows them to do that and then to put it on paper and then for us to talk about it, you know, and it also has, you know, where you could, you know, compare and contrast things. So it's actually really like the lesson that I chose because I tried it out with a few students and um, it was quite surprising how they interpreted the poem that I wrote. So it was, I mean, not that I wrote, that I, you know, presented to them. It was very surprising. <laughs> They're all different. And they're all the reasons were different, and it was it's it was it was pretty funny. So, it got them thinking, and it got them talking. It got them thinking and talking, and um, using their imagination and just interpreting what what they're what I was reading. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I picked my next one with math because it's a hand-on activity, and this activity can be a jazz for the kids in different levels. So my activity is by grouping, counting, and recognizing numbers. And I pick it because they said, and actually I apply in my classroom, the kids learn more from hand-on activities. Mm -hmm. That's why I pick it. Okay. And I chose my activity um, for celebrations because um, dance is universal and music is a fun way to teach children um, different domains, different um, areas of education. and. Dance and interacting in school helps to build a, a school community. And which what we're trying to do, we're talking about community, family, and culture. And the domains would be like oral language, you know, they're responding appropriately. Um, they're using common English nouns and phrases. And they're, they use math words. And then their physical is to use their gross motor skills through dance. Oh, and the other thing that I liked about the videos is I liked the one with the lady where she talked about how kind of we underestimate our students, children, ability and our to students' ability to understand things. And that yes. we really need to, you know, build their vocabulary because the mm -hmm. vocabulary is the basis of all learning. Yes. And we need to actually use those higher level words and use those critical thinking words so that they ask questions and it forces them to learn new vocabulary words. Mm -hmm. I like that too. The other important thing in the videos was about family and how the family influenced the learning of the kids and the development. And for me, the most beautiful part that I read was, was how the human being developed from the beginning. Yes. And one thing that um, caught my attention was we as a teacher don't know how was the de development mm -hmm. and how was the influence that I had from the beginning, from that yeah. inception. So that's why we, we have to be aware when we are working with children because we don't know. Yeah. And we have to stay there for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially yeah. if they're underdeveloped. Yes. Know, like mm -hmm. micro preemies and like things like that. They def they definitely have different learning abilities than mm -hmm. someone who yes. was born healthy and Ready, yes, so we sure. don't know the background about that. And mm -hmm. the families, we suppose in each family they have to support the kids, but no, all the families do that. Yeah. So, yes, nurture education at home. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>